quite awesome. It's recording? Yeah. So how's it going? Good. <laughs> it's been a while since we uh, talked on video. Yes. It has been um, over a year. See, I was thinking it'd be interesting to kind of just talk about AI in particular. Kind of think about some of the things that are happening in the field now and what's making these latest accomplishments really stand out. If you look at the trends of like people interested in AI right. um, now as compared to like 10 years ago, I think right. you'll see like major growth patterns. Right now, there's probably more interest in artificial intelligence than ever before. Mm -hmm. And previously, the peak would have been probably in the 70s. So when neural networks were first developed, most of the machine learning algorithms that we use were developed in around 1970. Who's the, who's the one that kind of came out with a book on languages. I don't know if it, I believe it was like Noam Chomsky, I want to say. You're talking about formal languages, yeah. right? And the the hierarchy. So that was around that time. I think that was maybe the late seven, late 60s. Yeah. Um, it seemed like there was this kind of um, I guess movement of like languages and learning techniques. Cuz if you look at like unstructured language, you see a lot of like potential there for being able to like group words into sentences and Right. I see what you're out. saying things of, figure out the content of those sentences. Some theorists were saying, you know, definitely language is structured, it has structure, so there are these, maybe these valid structures that we develop, and then we exchange utterances within these structures. So, you know, oh, we can have a structure that's okay, it has a noun, it has a verb, and then it has a, an object, mm -hmm. and then we can attach phrases on it. Yeah. And that's a valid structure. Chomsky's work uh, revolutionized that by saying, well, actually, um, there are sort of recursive structures. Like, there aren't a fixed number of structures in language. We can generate new ones. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And, like, so that, that kind of hierarchical, like, recursive element of learning, I think, is something that was strong at the, it was there at the time right like when they were first really going heavy into looking into this sort of thing but it's kind of persisted and it's been a common theme like this element of recursion mm -hmm. and like hierarchical patterns as being kind of fundamental to what we do and what differentiates us from like the other physical creatures it's, in the world right it it typifies intelligence yeah yeah it's like they didn't have big success and you could argue at the time, they, they didn't have a lot of compute power, which is true, right? They had a lot less than what we have now. Absolutely. So, like, their theoretical work um, was really great, and it was well accepted. And everybody said, yep, these guys are right. But then again, they couldn't, they couldn't produce something that changed society in a real way. Um, and it was, I think, largely down to uh, a lack of hardware. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. Like... There were some under, underlying key themes that were really good. Um, like, I don't know if, like, so around the time Neural Nets came out, I don't know mm -hmm. if that was around that same time. Yeah, definitely. But those ideas have been around for a while, that's true, but I guess... So there were Neural Nets, right? Um, yeah. But you couldn't train large ones in a reasonable amount of time. The neural networks that you'll see today, even on the machines that we have today, even being on a pretty large scale using, like, cloud computing, take on the order of days or weeks to train hmm. and that training is huge and if you had gone back to 1970 and tried to train the things that people are doing now it would be cost prohibitive really like you'd need a supercomputer and you'd need it for like months yeah to do anything to do something that you know we would think is something that a human can learn really easily yeah so maybe it is fair to say that like what's differentiating the results now from the past is that we just have all this extra compute power. We have like GPUs that could kind of do the hard math really fast. The theory around neural networks um, has been out, outpaced by hardware. Hmm. So today, basically, deep learning is comprised of sort of putting together a bunch of neural networks of different sizes and different orders. and just applying them to a problem and we've generally been very surprised within the last five years or so by how well that's done and we don't have a good theoretical reason why for a lot of the successes mm -hmm. right that's one of the really weird things like I can't think of another field in history 
at least I don't know maybe maybe somebody could correct me that that's this has happened some other time but where they just try something like they just make it bigger they just like throw some hardware at it and then suddenly they have successes that they couldn't have predicted with their theory you can get a, a sense for the weird way in which deep learning works with stuff like the uh, the like daydream stuff that Google created those oh, videos deep dream, deep dream. yeah deep dream that's yeah, right deep yeah. dream which is um, terrifying yeah you should, you should avoid it <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of it's very very trippy and weird yeah um, and very dog themed. <laughs> it has a lot of animals in it. Yeah, yeah. And, and slug themed. Yeah. But it's interesting. <laughs> so DeepMind was like a company by, um, I think his name. Kurzweil. Now. Yeah, Ray Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. um, who you know has a lot of books on like singularity and even like creating a mind. Mm -hmm. And he formed this company, uh, DeepMind, which I think was like pre-Google. And it was basically like acquired by Google. Yes. Or does it still operate independently or something like that? Um, and it was like after that that we started seeing a lot of interesting projects within Google that kind of related to deep learning. So it's almost like we're like experimentally discovering things that work well as opposed to thinking about like things that would work well right. and applying them. Right. Because um, it's almost come full circle where we had all this theory around neural networks and then we couldn't create practical applications for it that worked well. And then we shifted back for about like 30 years to doing things like logistic regression that are very, very simple and they're barely machine learning in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the sort of thing that you could derive intelligence from, for instance. Mm -hmm. you no, know, not something that people would generally think of as AI. They would just think of it as kind of like a smart algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we kind of capitalized on that for a while and we created a lot of cool stuff with it. There's tons of businesses now that are built on that kind of machine learning. Yeah. Almost every business benefits from that kind of machine learning. And then we went back to like to to a place where suddenly we're getting good results out of <laughs> theory we don't even understand yeah it kind of makes sense though like if you think about learning itself right or if you think about how evolution works mm -hmm. kind of comes back to like theory of evolution like you know the creatures weren't sitting there trying to like figure out a way to survive and then like creating a baby that had those properties it just kind of happened <laughs> through experimentation but it's scary though because you it, it's, scary, it's scary for the things that are existing at the time. It's scary for everyone involved because now we have a bunch of stuff that works really well and we can build a, real, a lot of really cool shit with it, mm -hmm. but we don't know how it works <laughs> or why it works. And if it stopped working, we wouldn't know how to fix it, sort of. Or if it made us stop working. <laughs>